Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's graph reading group. And we're joined by Simon and Albi from Harvard to talk about their paper about learning local representations of modules instead of doing message passing. And they show it's a lot more efficient and a lot faster. Uh, yeah, my name is Simon. Um, I'll be uh, presenting together with, with Albi. Uh, we'll be sort of switching back and forth. Um, we're both PhD student in uh, Boris Kaczynski's lab at Harvard. Um, I'm a third year, Albi's a second year. Um, and so we're going to be discussing um, a, a new model that we recently um, put out on the archive. And it's an approach for learning uh, interatomic potentials. So, so we're interested in um, predicting the energies uh, and the forces of a set of atoms. Um, and sort of the, the key feature of this is that we do this um, without message passing, and hence the, hence the title. Um, so we realize this is sort of a learning on graphs and geometry reading group. Um, but I do want to motivate very quickly um, what our lab does, where we come from, and then you'll see that you know we we speak I think the same language. We also think about graphs and geometry all day, but we sort of care about one very particular application, um, and that application is called um, molecular dynamics. So molecular dynamics is um, a very very widely used um, simulation technique, um, and it's a very very simple one. So the idea is you have um, a collection of atoms, so molecule or material, and then all you're doing is you're running time evolution on that. So you're simulating that just with Newton's equations of motion. So it's just F equals MA. So very, very basic physics, but the crux is that you have to, at every time step, get access to uh, this force um, acting on every atom, and you do that by computing um, the negative gradient of the energy. Um, and so I'll just show you sort of a few simple uh, examples of, of things we've run in our group. So for example, this is um, uh, uh, a lithium ion conductor for potential use in um, a battery. Um, and here you see um, uh, sort of a very typical simulation. You have in green the lithium ions and they move through this lattice, they move through this material. Um, and, and this is how we would study, for example, such a material. Um, another very recent application from our group here, this was a massive simulation of 0.5 trillion atoms done with um, the flare model in our group. Um, and this is an example from uh, catalysis. So here you have hydrogen on a platinum surface um, and you sort of see you know, the atoms moving over time and uh, attaching and detaching from, from the surface. But then it also goes beyond materials. Um, it's widely used. Oh, Hannes has a question. Yeah, well, why is this relevant, for example, to a model 11 trillion? I think you said 11 trillion. Uh, why can't we yeah. just look at the, the, a lot smaller patch and it should be about? Uh, great question. Great question. So it's half a trillion. But um, in general, <clears throat> there's two reasons. So one is a lot of things only uh, happen at certain uh, length scales. So sometimes you have, you know, whatever, you have a very large protein um, and it's surrounded by water. So you just need that length scale, right, to be able to capture it. And then the second one is that if you have um, a statistical process, like something where, for example, you have a reaction and that happens over time, right, then that will have a certain likelihood of happening. And if you have more atoms, you will just see that much, much sooner. Because if you have a trillion atoms and you have a certain probability of something happening versus if you have a hundred atoms and you have a certain probability of something happening, then obviously in a trillion atoms, you will collect more statistics, better statistics sooner. Okay. Yeah. That, that, the second point really, uh, I, I did not know about like that. We also maybe have a higher chance of observing some phenomena that we maybe exactly. want, to, want to observe. Okay. And exactly. do, do you sort of have if we are now looking at this thingy or the, this plane here where you're doing your mm -hmm. simulation, uh, maybe the surface of some material, and then mm -hmm. somewhere you just have a cutoff, like do you have some boundary or some periodicity condition? Ah, yeah, that... great question. So it depends on the system. So here, yes, this is periodic boundary conditions. So here, this surface, this XY plane essentially is, um, you know, infinitely repeated in space through these yeah. periodic boundary conditions. So that means if something, you know, exits sort of the, I guess I have the screen here. If an, if an atom moves and it exits, uh, you know, your simulation okay. box here, and then it will end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, but, a little besides the point, but still yeah. nice stuff. Yeah. 
first. Yeah, on, on your first uh, point regarding like the, the size of the crystal needed, um, you'll find like in the statistical mechanics and uh, in, the, uh, in the physics of crystals that the behavior of crystals is often determined by uh, the defects in the crystal. And the defects are also very rare. So in order to right. uh, simulate the defects correctly, you need a larger surface as well. Yes. Anyways, uh, that's, you can go. That's perfectly right. Because imagine if you have a defect in the middle and then because you repeat it periodically, that defect will at some point see the other defect, right? But if you have a larger cell, then it will, it will you know, be very, very far away. And then it will seem like it doesn't interact with the other one. And that's what you often want to simulate. Yeah, thank you. Right, but then this sort of goes beyond materials. Um, you know, this is uh, an application from biology where um, we use an equip to sort of, you know, fold a very simple, very small um, and protein, just to sort of highlight, you know, this goes from chemistry, biology, physics, material science, um, uh, et cetera, a very widely used method. And so again, the, the, the workflow is extremely simple. You have a set of atoms, you have some way of predicting the potential energy, and this is the, the crux of what we'll be after. Um, and then from that, you compute uh, the forces, and then you integrate Newton's equations of motion, and you do this over and over again. But uh, the key aspect here is that um, because we have to use a very small time step and at the same time want to simulate for very long times, the challenge is that we often have to integrate these equations of motions billions to trillions of times. And so this is sort of the central challenge that you're already you know, sort of thinking about as, a, as an ML person. I'm going to need something that's really accurate, right? I want this energy to be correct. I want it to give me the, the, the right forces that I simulate the right thing. But at the same time, it's also going to be, have to be insanely fast because I'm going to have to do this you know, billions to trillions um, of times. And so there's sort of traditionally been a few approaches on how we get this potential energy function. The first one is something called an empirical potential. Um, these are very, very simple functional forms. So typically these encode some very basic physics of the system, um, like uh, Coulomb terms, uh, bonded terms, et cetera. Um, they're sim very simple expressions, that, but they're insanely fast. They're insanely scalable. And so you can simulate really large systems over really long um, times. The other extreme um, is to use quantum mechanics to get this energy and these forces. Um, there, the nice thing is, you know, they're very accurate, they're from first principles. Um, but the downside is that they're very expensive and that they scale poorly with the number of um, electrons. And so typically you couldn't simulate very large systems and you couldn't simulate very long time scales. Um, and so, you know, obviously this is uh, an excellent application for ML and this has been happening for, I'd say, you know, 10 to 15 years or so. Um, that people have said, well, why don't we just, you know, fit to a library of these quantum mechanical calculations? Um, we're going to have uh, linear scaling with the numbers of atoms. We're going to try to keep this high accuracy, and sort of the goal is to be really, really fast, but retain this accuracy. And, and we're not, we're not, you know, perfect there, but this is sort of the the ultimate, um, the ultimate goal. Um, and so, if we if we sort of think a little bit about what would make um, uh, a, a successful machine learning intertwined potential. So that's that's the, the model approximating this potential energy surface. I think there's sort of five key properties we want. Obviously, we want to be accurate. I think that goes without saying. Obviously, we want it to be computationally efficient. Um, we just discussed that. But then one that's sort of particular to ML is we want it to be sample efficient. So we want it to be able to learn from small amounts of reference data. We want to have some level of theoretical understanding of why do these work? Um, you know, how do they work? Why do they make the predictions that they do? Um, I believe, you know, everyone can agree that this is really crucial. And then one thing that we think is, is sort of maybe the most important one right now is that we want them to be transferable. And so um, the reason for that is that, you know, we will sample training data always from some distribution, but then by definition, you know, with scientists, we're going to, we're going to try to discover something new, right? So by definition, we're going to encounter some, some, something during our simulation that we haven't seen before. And it's really important that we generalize to these um, out of distribution um, um, data. And so there's been sort of, you know, a myriad of, of approaches uh, um, uh, proposed for this from starting from, you know, linear models, GPs, and then lately mostly uh, uh, deep nets. Um, but one key thing that they all share is that how do you represent the geometry has been really, really important. Um, and so, you know, if I, if I give you just a set of atoms and I tell you these are the species and here's the positions um, and here's an energy, how do you represent that to the computer? 
Um, and there's uh, in particular four symmetries that we wanna, wanna respect. So the first one is if I have a molecule in space and has uh, some, some property, for example, the energy, and then I shift that in space, the energy will remain invariant. And, and I wanna build that into my model. Um, similarly, if I rotate it, again, the energy will not change. And again, I want to uh, make sure my model preserves that. Uh, one that's uh, particular in 3D is if I have a reflection, um, again, it remains invariant. And then one that's particular, uh, not to 3D, but just because we have to you know, encode things somehow is um, permutation uh, invariance, meaning you know, how do I label um, uh, the different atoms. Um, and sort of the, the most widely used approach, I think for the, or the most successful one, certainly for the past five years has been message passing networks. Um, I think I don't need to explain to this crowd how this works, but essentially the idea is every atom is a node, uh, every atom carries some high dimensional feature vector consisting of scalars. Um, and then, you know, over the layers, you uh, propagate information along the graph um, and, 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 and get access to, to some final energy. Um, and so some very popular examples that I think, you know, everyone has heard of is Schnett, uh, DimeNet. These are sort of, sort of the, the most widely used ones in practice. Um, and these are invariant, meaning that if I translate, rotate, um, or mirror the input, the energy will remain um, unchanged. Um, and so formally, what invariance means, if I have a function mapping between two vector spaces, x and y, I may call that function invariance with respect to the action of some group. If for all elements in the group, um, it is the same whether I just apply the function or I apply the function to, um, uh, for example, a rotated uh, input, if I were to take a look at the rotation group. Um, and then what we've done is uh, recently, you know, together with a lot of other groups, as we've said, can we generalize this invariance to equivariance? And um, in the equivariant message passing networks, um, uh, the idea is every atom now not only carries a set of scalars, but also a set of vector features. So this would you sort of label the X, Y, Z. Um, and then again, you sort of propagate this um, throughout the network um, and, and people have seen really dramatic improvements by uh, including uh, higher order uh, vectors and, and tensor features in addition to um, the scalars. And just to give a brief formal explanation of equivariance, um, a, a function, again, mapping between vector space X and Y, we call that equivariance with respect to the action of some group. If um, the function commutes with uh, the action of that group, meaning if it doesn't matter whether I first apply the function and then the group action or the group action and then um, the function. Um, and sort of a uh, very simple visualization. So this is from our NEQIP work here. What you're looking at here, this is a set of atoms. And then what I'm visualizing here is um, features inside the network and the, the color denotes the magnitude. Um, and so you see that as I rotate the system, so this is just a box of water essentially, um, you see that the color chain remains the same. And so these features are invariant under that rotation. And then in, in, in contrast, here you see um, the equivariant features, and as I rotate the structures, they rotate with the geometry, so they're equivariant um, under that, under that um, symmetry action. Um, all right, I think this is where we're going to do a quick switch, and Albi is going to uh, discuss a little bit of equivariance. See my slide? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Um, <clears throat> yes, so I want to drill a little bit into how we actually achieve this equivariance, because it's very important to understanding better, I think, our, our new Allegro architecture when we kind of move away from these familiar graph learning formalisms to have a better, uh, a better grasp of the underlying primitives of the equivariant learning that we're actually building up this new architecture out of. So the, the key thing in this family of equivariant networks that our approaches, Nequip and Allegro, both belong to. There, there are other ways one can approach this, but this is the formalism we live in, is that all the data you process, you understand as collections of geometric tensors. So this applies to the inputs to your model, so the in, initial structures, this applies to your internal features, and this applies to your outputs as well. And all of these we think of as collections of geometric tensors that transform in various different ways when you apply these symmetry operations to the input. So what's an example of, of, of a geometric tensor in this context? 
Uh, it doesn't just mean you know arbitrary multidimensional array the way it often means in machine learning. Uh, an example would be, for example, a scalars. So scalars, as Simon was talking about, just numbers that do not change, that are invariant under these symmetry transformations. Uh, you can think of something like the distance between two nodes, two atoms, is an invariant to all of these you know, rotations, translations, and so on. Another familiar example would be geometric vectors. The same vectors you know, that we've uh, dealt with all the time uh, that just you know, point in some direction. And how do we represent, well, there are more than these, but I want to stick to these two familiar objects for the moment. And how can we represent these sorts of objects? Well, scalars, for example, are quite simple. A scalar is just a real number in this context. So we just have some single, some single number, some single float. Vectors also, you represent almost exactly as you would expect. You just have some group uh, of numbers. You have some X, Y, Z component. You know, it's, again, sort of exactly what you would expect. And then when you're building a full feature vector, for example, out of these individual tensors, you're just putting them all together. You're taking the representations of all these various tensors and you're grouping them. And this is what gives you a feature vector in the you know, linear algebra rather than geometric sense. A little bit more specifically on mathematically, uh, each of these tensors in this pile that makes up our features inhabits a, a so-called irreducible representation of this O3 symmetry group. And it's not particularly critical, you know, the obscure, more mathematical details of that, but what's important is that these describe different ways you can transform under one of these O3 symmetry operations. And they describe it in a simple systematic way that carries some indexes that we can interpret. The first of those indexes is this rotation order L. And L tells you what happens to a tensor that you know, inhabits, that has a given L under rotations. So a rotation order of zero indicates a scalar, something that does not change under rotation. A uh, rotation order of one is a vector. Again, this familiar you know, sort of X, Y, Z points in the direction. But there, it also generalizes to these higher values, these higher rotation order tensors. The other important index here uh, corresponds to the other symmetry that Simon mentioned of inversion or mirrors, re reflections. And this is the parity. And this tells you what happens when you mirror your system. How does the tensor transform? A parity of one just means you're invariant. Your tensor does not change under inversions. A parity of minus one means that you gain a sign flip under inversions. So you can think about, you know, for example, a vector. If you, in, you know, mirror a vector, you change its sign so with a parity of minus one. And the same way that you know, a scalar can be described by one number and a vector by three, this generalizes and a tensor of some order L has this increasing dimension with L of 2L plus one. So an important question that this kind of immediately leads to is if you're thinking about a point cloud in space, you know, some pile of atoms that we want to start to understand in this formalism is how can we move the information we have into this kind of tensor um, formalism, this pile of tensors. And the answer here is the spherical harmonics, which, you know, for those of you who may not have encountered them, are, are simply a basis for functions that live on the sphere in 3D space. So they're just a basis for functions in terms of, you know, phi, psi. Um, and they're a very special basis. There are a lot of bases you could put on the sphere, but the spherical harmonics are specifically the basis that decomposes functions into this pile of tensors that inhabit irreducible representations that are indexed by these L and P values. So and what, so, you're, what yeah. you're saying is I have, a, I have now a sphere and for every point on the sphere, I assign a value or I have a function that takes a point on the sphere and assigns the value. And this function, I can similarly also write by a sum of these basis functions, right? Where, but only by choosing the right coefficients for each one of those basis functions. And how many coefficients do I need to, um, yeah, to turn each function into the one of those uh, sums? Absolutely. Um, that's a very fundamental question. At a, 
well, I, I should bring up this graphic because it's easier to think about when you can look at it, right? These are visualizations of the spherical harmonics. So what you can see is that the basically the angular frequency of these increases with L. So what this L controls, how many basis functions you use controls is your angular resolution with which you can actually resolve your function. They are, you know, a Fourier series. It's similar, you can think about it to, you know, Fourier analysis of some 1D signal. You can think of it very similarly. Um, so if you have some very complex function, you're gonna need a lot of them. But one of the nice things uh, in the, these architectures that we are designing at least, is that the functions we are projecting out are very simple. They are in fact just single delta functions because we start with just a direction, right? You can think of the sort of unit vector between two atoms, right? And that can be thought of as a function on the sphere as just a delta function because it just has some direction. And that's the function that we are projecting out. So that's a very simple function for which we find in practice that, you know, we can get away with a, a limited truncated basis set. But in the general case, yes, you do need, you know, infinitely many of these to perfectly reproduce some arbitrary function on the sphere. And if you have some very complex function with, you know, a great deal of angular activity, so to speak, you will need uh, many more of these higher order basis functions. Okay, but now I have a, like, I have these functions which I can sum up and tell you the coefficients with which you take each function uh, that you sum up to then end up with a final function on the sphere. But how, how do I turn my vector into, or how do I use that to represent my vector? Ah, so you represent the vector exactly as you're saying, as the coefficients of the basis projection. So if you start with your vector, you think of it as a delta function on the sphere, you project it, and then this gives you a set of coefficients, which exactly are these geometric tensors. So in fact, if you project this delta function onto just the L equals one spherical harmonics, which if you remember in the last slide, I said are vectors, what you get back is exactly up to some normalization constant, x, y, and z. In this sort of, you know, I don't know if you see my mouse cursor, but yeah, really. uh, in, in this first, first tensor here, but you can also project onto the higher order basis functions to get these geometric tensor representations to get more coefficients that represent this same vector, okay, but, but that transform according to these higher order tensors. And the, but this is now a cool thing because if we only change these uh, coefficients, then we ensure that um, if we were to transform back, that we would have transformed the vector equivalently. Exactly, exactly. Um, what's, what's so helpful and powerful about this representation is that it allows us to bring sort of a more limited geometric object like the vector uh, into, a, into sort of a full spectrum of geometric tensors that we can then process in some equivariant way uh, and do it all in a, a symmetry respecting and correct manner, precisely. All right. Okay, but uh, we, we can't now, with our coefficients, can we do whatever we want and every transformation will be equ equivariant? No. Um, so that's, the, that's the, key, the key thing here is that these representations are equivariants rather than invariants, these coefficients. So the only one that's invariant, it's not even shown here, is L equals zero, which is just uh, a constant over the whole sphere as a basis function. And that does give you something invariant to which you can do whatever you please. But these others are equivariants that you have to deal with carefully. Mm -hmm. Which is actually a perfect segue into my, well, not quite my next slide, but where we're going. Um, the one other point I want to make about these tensor features is, just to repeat again that you know you don't take a single tensor as a feature you know with a, some specific l you take a big pile with different l's and p's and you put them all together formally speaking this inhabits a direct sum of ereps and the only reason i mention that the only reason i think one wants to care uh, at a sort of uh, design level is that that's a very powerful and very general kind of object to be working with for the reasons that 
any physical quantity, anything that comes out of physics here, transforms with some representation of this O3 symmetry group. And any such representation of the O3 symmetry group decomposes into exactly a direct sum of EREPs. So when you work with these sorts of objects, you're working with something extremely general and very rich that can, uh, for, from the simple argument, basically be relevant to almost any kind of physical learning task you want to work on. And just to sort of emphasize what's happening here in terms of symmetry correctness, in contrast to machine learning methods that don't use this equivariant approach at all, if you start with no constraints at all, well, if you just use uh, you know, some, I don't know, you project onto a grid and just use a, a CNN, for example. When you transform your input, your internal features are going to transform arbitrarily, completely arbitrarily. And your outputs are also going to transform arbitrarily, which is not what we want. When you take an invariant network, like Schnet, for example, or DimeNet, when you transform your input, your internal features don't transform at all, and thus your energy is also invariant, which is what we want, but is sort of a more limited subset, again, of equivariant, where when you transform your input, also your internal features transform correspondingly because they are geometric tensors, and still you can get a symmetry respecting output. And the big question then, and what sort of Hannes was leading us to, is how can you build such a network? What operations are actually equivariant? And the absolutely most important one that I just want to talk about briefly is this tensor product, so-called tensor product of representations, which is a, you've probably seen this before. Uh, we used it in the equip. It's used in a lot of the other equivariant approaches. Um, but to sort of drill into the details, the tensor product is an equivariant operation that combines two different tensors, geometric tensors, in a bilinear way. So we have here, you know, just kind of a, a tensor contraction in the general sense. And then the key uh, equivariant part of this are these Wigner 3J coefficients, which we're also contracting these tensors with. And what these do is they project back, they're a change of basis, they project back this sort of general tensor product back into a direct sum of EREF. So back into this system of geometric tensors that we want to understand all of our features using. So they let us do this product within this irreducible representations formalism. And another really important part about the tensor product is that it can produce a wide variety of output tensor types uh, of output tensor L's and P's that are different than the ones you've put into it. So this is what lets you go from just having a pile of different geometric tensors kind of that are separate from one another to actually interacting them in a symmetry respecting way and getting out more tensors of different irreducible representation. And just to give some examples of operations that fall under this umbrella that are very familiar, scalar multiplication, say just multiplying two real numbers together is a tensor product here uh, between scalar representations. The vector vector dot product, the inner product between two geometric vectors, also is a tensor product. It's one of things subsumed by this operation. So like for the scalar multiplication now, we're mm -hmm. saying if if you the p tells me p is one, and that tells me if you reflect your coordinate system, then do nothing with the coordinates. And they stay the same. And now, if you uh, come to your next um, vector vector dot product, there you have this this one vector. And if you if we were to flip our coordinate system, then we would have to invert, or then we would have to put a minus in front of all our coordinates to keep to stay with the same vector. Yeah. But if we take the uh, the dot product then the scalar that we get out again, we still want, uh, it still doesn't change. Right? Exactly. And there are a couple of nice ways to understand that. One of them is just if you think about the sign flip, right? If you take, you know, some three tuple, you know, X, Y, Z, and you, you know, put a minus in front of it, you inter product that with something else, you add minuses, you know, all the minuses cancel out. But yeah. a nice geometric way to think about that is that, well, what is the dot product? You know, we, we all probably remember it gives you the, the cosine of the angle between the vectors, right? And so that 
the angle between the vectors, if you sort of mirror your system, I, I can't mirror my hands, my wrists don't move that way, but if you, you know, mirror your system, right, has the angle between the vectors changed? Well, no, it hasn't. That angle is an invariant. And that's what this dot product is computing indirectly is that angle. So that's, I think, a, a nice geometric way to think about why, you know, the inputs could transform in certain ways under some symmetry operations, but this output gives us something that does not. Yeah. And a final just sort of example of a sort of basic geometric operation that actually falls under this umbrella is also the vector vector cross product, where you take two vectors, you take the cross product, and you get, you know, the normal to the plane they lie in. This also is one of these tensor products uh, where, again, you can see that, you know, we have a different P, for example, than of the inputs, uh, just as before we had a different parity that we had in the inputs. And the last point I want to make here before handing it back off to Simon uh, is that equivariance using these approaches really dramatically improves machine learning potentials. Uh, and equip is just one example of that. And an interesting point, and this sort of gets us to, to what we were discussing with the title, is that all existing equivariant neural network MLIPs are message passing. They all use the message passing formalism. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it back off to Simon. All right, so I'll, I'll just very quickly sort of reintroduce um, an equip. Um, and then, and then I'll move on to to uh, Allegro. But sort of the the key thing of Nequip was that it demonstrated that we can, um, for, by just introducing this equivariance, get fundamentally uh, better molecular ML. And there's sort of been a, a few key things that came out of this. But the 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 main one we observed is that we get this massively increased uh, sample efficiency. So uh, in particular, what we showed is we compared to sort of a very widely used method called DeepMD. Um, and we show that with a thousand times fewer data, it, it still does, you know, um, uh, uh, quite a bit better. Um, another nice thing we observed is that um, it actually has different scaling laws. So here what you're looking at is uh, the error as a function of training set size. Um, and you see that as you increase the training set size um, in the um, equivalent network, the error actually goes down uh, quicker than the invariant one. Um, and then, you know, finally, we, we sort of done um, uh, very complex reactive systems with this. Um, and so here you see, uh, again, one of these catalytic systems, um, and, and it can capture this. But, but, but as Albie said, this is message passing, right? And, and so just to, to sort of very quickly illustrate why message passing might have some downfalls here, um, here's a very simple example of um, water in uh, a box. And so you see here in, in, in black, this bounding box, and then you see it sort of repeated um, periodically uh, uh, through space. And now if you were to take um, a local um, uh, interaction uh, radius of uh, six angstrom, which is sort of a pretty normal, pretty normal uh, uh, choice, then you'd have roughly hundred atoms in this uh, uh, cutoff sphere. Um, but the issue is that with message passing, you know, say you have six layers, then this will propagate information out. Um, and now your effective cutoff you know, six layers times uh, six angstroms will actually be 36 angstrom. And so suddenly you have to keep 21,000 atoms um, into your cutoff sphere. And as you can imagine, if you want to scale to large systems and if you want to parallelize this, then this is the number of atoms that you actually have to hold on each um, uh, device. And there you sort of see the fundamental limitation um, of message passing in terms of scalability. All these atoms, all their states through the message passing end up on this one final atom. So if I want to parallelize this, then this one final atom here has to hold in the information of all these um, uh, uh, atoms uh, on each um, on each device that I want to parallelize over. And this is sort of the because of this cubic growth of atoms. You know, we said, um, you know, is there a way to move past this um, uh, message passing? And so in particular, the idea was, you know, we we saw equivariance works really well, and we like equivariance, but do we really need message passing? Um, and so I want to very briefly uh, give, an, uh, give uh, sort of the high level introduction of Allegro, and then we're going to go a little bit more into the mathematical uh, details. So the conventional GNN, how we would represent the energy is we would say the energy of the system is a sum over the um, energy of each atom. So we have um, our graph 
and then each of these atoms carries um, yeah can, can we maybe uh, as, as a reminder have a quick statement what do we want as the inputs out of our model and what do you want to finally predict ah of course yeah definitely great question okay um so the input is just the geometry so where are the atoms in space ah. and then their chemical species so what are the atoms that's all the input you have and then the output is the energy of that system so Does that makes sense uh an energy of the whole system, uh, but you now put it together out of energies of individual nodes. Yeah. Exactly. So exactly. So you say I have some total energy of a system and I have a set of atoms. And then you make the modeling assumption that you're going to say the total energy is a sum of these atomic energies. And the reason you do this is because very often you can only train on data at a certain size. Because that's the, the the largest you can you can do with your with your QM method. So say you can do 100 or 200 atoms at a certain size, but then you want to simulate something that's much much larger. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to say, well, every atom is going to predict some atomic energy, and then at inference time, I can scale up to something much much larger, and I can still get a final energy that is extensive, so that 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 scales with the system size. Does that make sense? Great. Okay, right. So this would sort of be the conventional uh, GNN setup. And so everything is on a per node level. Um, in the Allegro setup, everything is on a per pair level, or I guess per edge in the, in the graph uh, 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 language. And so here, what we're going to say, we still have a total um, uh, energy, but the way we're going to model this now is as a double sum IJ over a quantity EIJ. And this EIJ is now um, associated with each pair of atoms. So we're going to say this is the atom of um, uh, the um, ordered pair i and j. And then if we uh, if we sum over all of these, we still get the total um, energy. And the second key difference is that now our features, these h's, are also associated on a per pair basis and not on a per per node um, basis. OK. And, and OK, so this brings us into the, into the Allegro architecture. Um, and so the, the, the Crooks background is that we have two tracks. We have an invariant track and an equivariant track. So the invariant track only consists of scalars and the equivariant track consists of scalars, vectors, higher order tensors, as Albi just described. Um, and then as, as Hannes asked and as Albi then explained, on the invariants, you can do whatever you want, right? Because there's no way you can, you can mess them up. All operations are allowed. On the equivariants, you can only perform equivariant operations. And so this is sort of the, the key setup between the two. And then these tracks interact throughout the networks. And so now you know you're going to ask, okay, why, why are you doing any of this, right? Like why, why this two-track architecture? And so the key design principle behind all of this has been that uh, in Equip and, and in other networks, we always found scalars are cheap, tensors are expensive. So sort of the, the, the simple example you could think of is scalar operations would, for example, just be an MLP, right? MLPs are insanely optimized on modern GPUs. They're really, really, really fast operations. Tensors, tensor operations, tensor products are typically quite slow. And so our idea was, well, what if we just have a large set of scalars, which are really fast, and they control a small set of tensor operations? And that's why we have this two-track architectures where the scalars interact with uh, the, um, the tensors. Um, OK. And so this brings us into the core math. All right, so imagine we have some setup here. We have atoms i, j, and k. And we have a feature associated with this pair of atoms i and j. And then we say the way that we're going to update this feature is by um, a sum over the atoms k in the neighborhood of i. And we're going to say we're going to compute in here a tensor product between the previous state of i, j, and then this spherical harmonic embedding of i, k. And we're going to weight that somehow. Right, because we're going to compute a sum over k, and then each of these is going to carry one of these tensor product interactions. And, and then what this sort of gives us from a very simple correlation order standpoint is we now have a, a three body interactions, right? We have ij and ik, and we've coupled them in a way to give us an ijk correlation. And so this can capture correlations between uh, three atoms. 
And then if we were to do this again, we would have interaction between four bodies, between five bodies, et cetera. And this is how you build up a more complex um, um, uh, description of your energy. And this is sort of the, the key thing that you're interested in. The downside is that naively this gives exponential scaling, right? Because in the, in, the, in the simple case of just this equation without doing this in any iterated way, you would now have quadratic scaling, right? Because you have to have all the ijs uh, talk to all the iks. And so that's obviously something that you want to avoid, right? Because as you go to higher order ones, this will quickly become extremely expensive. And so the idea that we had, and, and we're, we're borrowing a trick here that's called the density trick. That's not something that we invented. I, I put the reference down here. The idea is that, okay, right now we're saying we have a pair feature associated with the pair ij talking to another pair feature associated with a pair ik, right? And then we sum over these k's, we weight this, and we update the new state of ij. We can pull this w um, ik inside here. And so essentially now we're just weighting the, the spherical harmonics projection. That's fine. But then the key point here is that this tensor product is bilinear, as we said, right? So it's linear in both its arguments. And that means that we can actually pull out this Hij outside of the sum. And so now what we're doing is we're now computing a tensor product between, again, this pair feature Ij, tensor product with the sum. And so now this is a sum over K of the weighted spherical harmonics. And now you can see that we can first perform the sum. And this will give us then a single tensor, a single feature that's associated with the environment. And then we compute one tensor product with this pair feature ij. And thereby, you see this exponential scaling is removed, right? No. Because we first perform the sum. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't see that. Uh, like, we still have to do a huge sum, right? Or we still have to do our sum. and in the next or the next time we will also mm -hmm. have to do uh, a, big, a big sum so okay yeah. count count the number of tensor products right Ten, remember tensor products are expensive right that is the yeah and so here you're doing this k times right you're doing tensor product ij with and the current k we only have one tensor product now you only have one tensor product and this gives you this massive massive speed up Good. Great. Okay. And so this is sort of the, the, the high level summary. We say, well, this is a linear operation or bilinear, and we can pull this out. And now we're linear scaling with a correlation order. So every time we want to add a new correlation order, we just have to do an extra tensor product. This is sort of the, the key feature from the mathematical standpoint. And then if we go back out and look at the architecture again, here you see on the left, the scalar track in blue, on the right, this um, tensor track in red. And here, you know, this is the, the pretty math visualization of what we just discussed. This is this tensor product. And then what I'm highlighting here is just the two are coupled. So we take these tensors. This is just a simple co concatenation. We put them back into the scalar track and then both of these get updated by an MLP and, and we move on. And we do this over and over again. And then on the left here, you just see, you know, we have our invariant embedding. We have our equivariance, blue and red again. We have multiple of these layers. And then the final output is this prepare energy EIJ. We sum all of them. That's it. So that is that is sort of the um, that is the 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 crux of the Allegro architecture. And, so there's, there's question about that now. It's probably a good time. Yeah. And why do we not call it a message passing when we take the sum over all of our neighboring edges? Right. So there is no message passing in the sense there's no messages being passed along the graph, right? All of this is local to the environment of I. So what you have to keep in mind here, Oops, sorry. What you have to keep in mind here is that this IJ, this is an ordered pair. So what we're saying here is this is the state of ij, but local to i. And so this k only runs over the sum of neighbors in the environment of i. And so what this is doing then, this is simply updating here with this geometry of ik. And so this is just computing tensor product after tensor product after tensor product. But there's no message being passed, really, right? Um, sorry. Um... 
But the message is implicitly computed, right? Even if you don't have a explicit sort of representation of that message, you're still sort of implicitly computed. Where, where is it computed? Well, even in like, in like let's call it classical message passing, you okay. still sort of have, um, you still, it's like the local, the each step is still a local neighborhood, right? In an X hop neighborhood or something. So that's mm -hmm. still local. And yeah. I mean, like a message, in some cases, you're explicitly computing it, but like you can also just implicitly compute it. Right? If you just concatenate that, if you yeah. concatenate all the operations and say, oh, cool, I'm going to do it at the end. And, and these operations are now this tensor, this tensor product that you have. Yeah. Um, that's, would that. That's yeah, sorry, go ahead. I mean, would that would casting the problem in that light be equivalent? Yeah, I didn't quite get it. Can you say where where's the sorry, where's the message? <laughs> Maybe that's the smarter way. Like where's the propagation of, of, of previous features? So you have the previous feet. Um let's say you have a node, let's say you have an edge E1, which has whose surrounding edges. So edges which are incident on the nodes near this E1 are um, E11, E12, so on and so forth, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So these have some features associated with them, whatever they may be, mm -hmm. right? So at each step, I can either explicitly say, oh, cool, I will have, I will now create a message. I'll create a, I will create an explicit vector or something associated with the node and then transfer it. Or I can just sort of concatenate all the operations that would have happened with this um, network. And my question is, is that sort of an is that is that represent is that casting of the problem where I've just concatenated uh, where I've sort of composited all the operations which are likely to to occur? Is that um, is that what's happening here in this tensor sort of uh, tensor multiplication thing? Uh, yeah. Um, Abhi, do you want to? I'm still not 100 percent sure. I understand. Sure. You said I, I think I, if I'm if I'm not misunderstanding. I'm not sure entirely what you mean by composite of operations, but I think the key point here is that the answer to the first half of your question is yes. You can formally write this out as a local message passing among edges that share the central index i, right? These are ordered, yeah. ordered indices. Yes. I mean, you can write almost anything that way. Um, but I think more sort of morally, it's not particularly useful because the propagation is so limited, right? That the indexes, all the key here lives in the indexes. Um, and, and so, I, yes, you can formally, you know, you can write something that is equivalent. You can define something as an update function and something as a message from, you know, uh, edges IJ to IK. Um, but I don't know that it's a particularly useful way to think about the model. Uh, if I'm because this again, may help, you know, I mean, this lack it, of propagation. It, yeah, it's it's purely local what you've defined here. So it's not message passing in the conventional sense with GNNs where you have messages propagating. You know, so you you, you know you you calculate the, the the local neighborhoods and then you propagate. You know, to uh, you truncate at some level in the in the graph. But here, it's purely just local to to the node. That's right. correct. So. The, so there's no, there's no, it's not message passing at all um, in the in the context of you know how we understand it with GNNs. It's a purely exactly. local. But I yeah. think those... right. The stupid comparison I would make is like imagine you have you know something where just the only prediction the network makes you know, it feeds you out the number of neighbors, right? The sort of degree of each node. You can also write this right. in the message passing formalism, for example, you know, along with many other right. things, but. Yeah. You know, it, that doesn't make it message passing in sort of the yeah. sense we want to understand it. Okay. Um, in that case, um, may, may I ask what, like, how would you define what, according to you, would be message, explicit message passing, passing? And where would that, is it only sort of its receptive field which sets it apart, or are there other characteristics that you? I mean, okay. So, so there, there's a few things, right? Like, there's sort of the, the two key equations from the neural message for quantum chemistry, the, the Gilmer paper, right? But the, the issue with those two equations is that they are very abstract, and I can put a lot of things into these two equations, right? I can say mm -hmm. a matrix multiplication is a 1D CNN, right? A lot of things are formally true, but that doesn't make them 
practically helpful in any framework, right? And so if you were to want to put this into these two equations from the Gilmer paper, you would just take all the math and put in the update function, right? Mm -hmm. And then yes, you've defined a message passing network, but have you really? And so to us, it's yes, there's this structure of these two equations, essentially the message and the update, but there's also this propagation of messages, right? That's the name. There's messages being passed along the graph. And that is not happening here in that. In that in so, I would so add to that just that, you know, if you look at this, it's not, you know, a, a strict dividing line, but to a certain extent, you know, how much of the complexity lives in the, the messages versus the update. As Simon says, you know, you can put anything in the update and express almost anything in this formalism. If you look at the equation that's still up on the screen, right, you'll notice that, you know, the, the sum, right, that, that you are considering sort of equivalent to the passing, to write the accumulation of messages, what goes inside there is quite simple. Most, uh, most of the complexity lives in, you know, what, what you would consider the update function if you were to try to write this, because it lives in the tensor product, right? That's in stark contrast to the quip, where the tensor product lives inside the message, uh, right? You, you can't sort of, and the update function is, is comparatively much simpler. It remains more or less just a sum. So I don't know that that's, you know, fully general thing okay. you can use the line, but I think so, it's a so useful in some, point in some me. sense, In some sense, what you've done is it's basically sort of feature engineering where you're capturing the local geometric um, properties at each at each atom effectively. And that those are encoded in these clef scoring coefficients in some sense in this tensor. Precisely. Yeah. Um, if you okay. read, you know, our paper, we call this environment feature the embedded environment for exactly this reason, yeah. because it is a learned mm -hmm. embedding of your atomic right. density. Right. So I, I think I think his question might be like, so if you were to use uh, conventional message passing, uh, it, it, you know, mm. if you didn't use this this type of approach, in theory, it would learn the network would in in principle learn these these features. Perhaps I mean these. Ah. Great question. I, no. so, so first of all, can we maybe clarify this information? any type of information uh, going from a uh, distant node to our node i, like from a three hot the distant node, um, this information from there going to, uh, to the edge that's, or is, a, is the information from an edge that is three hops distant from our current edge, still ending up at this edge at some point after three layers? No. So the, the, the point here is if it's an edge ij, it yeah. will only see things that are inside of the environment of i. So if I have something three hops away, I will never see that, right? Everything is inside of i. Yes, there's information shared between everything that's in i, right? That's the point. I have ij talking to ik1, talking to ik2, right? Those are the correlations I want. Their messages are in a sense being passed, right? Their information is being propagated, but there is no message passing outside of this IJ. Yeah, but then, and again, this comes from the indexing. If, if you have to watch the yeah. ordering of the indexes because IJ is not the same. If you look at this graphic, it is a different edge than JI. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when you, process later Adam J in this picture and it involves, you know, these other two neighbors outside of the cutoff, they may update the state of edge JI, but that's a completely independent state from the state IJ. So, so this would suggest that the local geometry around a given atom is determined by the global geometry in some sense. I mean, one, one would think, right? That, I mean, this is capturing the local geometry, but somehow, yes. the, yeah. The idea is the idea is to say that in order to describe to describe a global property, you can decompose it into local things, and that Adam I only needs to see information within a finite cutoff radius. That is the fundamental idea. The idea is that physically there is some yeah. interaction bet between beyond which nothing contributes. That is the that is the right. Point. But it's I right. still that, think that, it's that I still think it is hard to see. Um, you just have the sum over uh, over the neighboring edges of the uh, of the of our current edge, 
And yeah, then you, it is a very understandable to think that we will end up with information being passed from one edge to the next to the next uh, over each um, over each message passing layer. Yeah, well, but there's still uh, an MLP in the end of the day, right? And that MLP is going to yeah. look at all the local geometric structures ultimately to, I mean, that's where the global, you know, the global geometry in some sense is, yeah, factored in, right? Because there's still an MLP at the end of the day, yeah. looking at all these lo local Well, the MLP features. is per local environment. Hmm. Oh, there's no final MLP oh. connecting anything. This, once oh, you've done this, and there's MLP inside the local thing, you get one scalar energy for this EIJ, and then you sum those, and that's it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So we're making a very strong assumption about the decomposition of the energy into local contributions, but it's not, uh, that's not a novel assumption. That's very common among people who do like kernel methods for our application or linear models. Mm -hmm. They all make this strong assumption, and there's a huge variety of papers that empirically find that, you know, very, very, very often it holds. Yeah. Mm. Okay, good. But then I would like to move on to Tim Hadzi Vilishkovic's question. Uh, yeah. Hey, I have a short question. Um, just to see if I understand this correctly. So if you were to stack, let's say, infinitely many of these layers, would you end up with uh, an oversmoothed graph or that, or wouldn't that not be an issue in your scenario? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So, okay, so essentially what you would not end up with is the typical GNN problem where your, where your receptive field becomes very, very large, right? Because your receptive field will remain the set of, you know, K in the neighborhood of I. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that answers the question. Yeah, okay, thanks. You clear that? <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, that's uh, still referring a little bit about uh, to, to this locality discussion earlier. So if no information is ever propagated beyond that cutoff radius, what, what exactly is the difference then to say you want to run your simulation on, on half a trillion atoms and you simply like cut this off into small um, local environments around each individual atom and do like mini message passing around there and never let it see the outside environment and just stack everything together at the end. That is very similar, essentially. So you're saying cut it off into these single hop, essentially these single yeah. environments, then perform something in there, mm -hmm. then sum it all up. Yep. That is similar. Yeah, there's still, of course, differences, right? We do this prepare, right. we do the right. tensor product, et cetera, et cetera. But fundamentally, that's a very similar approach. Yeah, nice, thanks. Okay, let's go for one more question on that. So would you be losing the message passing benefits of like looking at a larger cutoff radius and grabbing all the correlations? Because you're just looking at local environments here. Are you losing anything that you would have in the message passing world? Yes, yes, um, you would, um, if that were to matter. But the thing that we sort of very consistently find is it doesn't. Because you can select a very large cutoff radius with your model or? No, that's the, that's the thing, right? You do not need a very large cutoff radius, right? So the cutoff radii are still sort of very, very simple cutoff radii. But, but the thing is that contributions beyond a certain uh, point simply do not uh, contribute because interactions are fundamentally physically local. Um, I mean, I said uh, the David's question is the last question, but it's dumb, so <laughs> let's go. So um, I would like to challenge a bit this assumption. I know that uh, most of the interaction are local, but uh, one thing that can happen is like the emergence of some uh, crystal properties when you take like uh, thousands of uh, atoms together. For example, this is how you, you can have like uh, magnetism. You cannot um, model magnetism by looking only at radius of five atoms and seeing uh, if, they're al if their spin are aligned, right? You need to look like at the global alignment of uh, the crystal in general. 
Um, so mm. I'm challenging a bit this assumption, but uh, in some sense, like uh, I like this idea of the architecture of um, limiting the environment. And instead of proposing like message passing to solve this problem, like others do, uh, the way I, I would view it is maybe have, have the same approach, but at different scales and with the pooling such that um, like a, a top-down pooling uh, similar to, yeah. to what is done, for example, in UNet for right. images. So, yeah, yeah, so, so let, me, let, me give a, let me give a bit of an extended answer to that. So yes, there are physically long-range interactions, right? There's, for example, Coulombic terms that can act over very, very long distances. But the approach here, and this is again, not something we've invented. This is very, very common in, in, in the field of like dynamics is to say all the messy, interesting quantum stuff happens in this very local interaction, right? So there we're gonna say after five or six angstrom, nothing important happens anymore. And then if you say, yes, I do have very, very long range interactions that I wanna capture, then the way you do it is you say your total energy is a sum of this Again, local messy quantum term where you need your super complex NN plus whatever physical long range term I know. And so this is the way folks have approached this. They would then say, I'm going to have a total energy that's a sum of local plus there might be some very slowly decaying Coulombic term, but that is something where I have very simple physics that I can do. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah, right. So you're basically saying uh, this is needed for the hard part which is quantum mechanics and exactly. everything that has to do with classical electromagnetism or classical mechanics well you don't need complex simulations yeah. right yeah yeah i would still like though to to have this uh, method uh, as a hierarchy of different radius so i think that that would allow like uh, to model um uh, not only atomic interaction but also like um, uh, let's say um, uh, cluster interactions and things like that. But uh, I do understand yeah. that like uh, most of the accuracy comes already with your model. Right, and the issue is you will lose all the benefits of this model, right? Like the, the, the massive benefit of this model is, is scale. It's because you only have to keep a finite set of atoms on each core or on each GPU or on it, whatever you're parallelizing over is now you can go massively parallel. If you choose a very large interaction radius, the number of atoms you have to keep on each device grows cubically, and you end up with something that has the same issue as message passing, right? And so that's sort of the, that's, that, that's the trade-off where we're saying, go local, and then you can go parallel. One other thing I want to just say very briefly in, in response to that question is that I am not aware. I mean, if you're, I've also, this question back to all of you because you're, you're a crowd that probably knows this, but I am not aware that anyone has ever actually demonstrated very conclusively that message passing networks it trained on these particular kinds of systems are actually learning long range interactions um, in, in you know, helpful, meaningful ways. Um, if somebody knows of you know, such, such a demonstration, I'd be very interested to see it, but I don't know that I think it's often assumed, um, but it's not hard, especially for like simpler non-equivariant ones to come up with easy counter examples of long range things that they can't even learn very directly. Um, so I think that's another relevant point. Yeah, no, I, I agree there, I agree. Um, okay, so I, I think we spent a lot of time already on this set of questions. So uh, I think it's best if we finish the presentation, I'm sorry, John, <laughs> um, if we finish the presentation and uh, finish the discussion afterwards. Thank you. Sounds good. Okay, great. All right, cool. Moving on to sort of the results. Um, one very widely used benchmark for molecular dynamics is, is something called MD17. I'm sure many of you have, have heard or seen that. And um, the idea is it's a set of uh, 10 small molecules in vacuum. Um, and we have uh, quantum mechanical energies and forces on, on those molecules. And then what people do is they train on uh, 1000 of these structures. Um, and then they simply measure the MAE in the energies and in the forces. And so what you're seeing here is a few very widely used approaches. Uh, GAP, which is a, is a GP, uh, ANI, which is an NN, and ACE, which is a linear method. Uh, and you're seeing the force errors and the energy errors. Um, and then what we showed a while ago is that NEQIP is, is able to 
to you know massively um, improve upon upon these errors. And equip is again equivalent message passing where you do have this this uh, growth of the cutoff radius. Um, and then in blue here, you're seeing Allegro, and you see sort of it it does on most of them a little bit better, on some a little bit worse, but sort of very very similar to an equip without any notion of of this message passing. And this is sort of the key thing. Uh, that we found is that you do not need uh, the, the, the you know, propagation of information. You can still get very, very nice results. One thing that I think you know, more people here will, will know is the QM9 benchmark. Uh, this is uh, saying I'm not going to have a fixed molecule, but I'm going to go across compositional space. So I'm going to have uh, uh, different molecules um, and train on uh, 110,000 um, uh, structures and then measure um, properties of these molecules and you know we're interested in, in energies and so we picked four energy related targets here and we're comparing against Schnett, DimeNet and you know the usual suspects um, and sort of see it very very um, consistently uh, uh, state of the art and that's all nice and everything but one thing that I, I, we thought was much much more interesting is that we could just use a single Allegro layer um, and still um, perform better than anything that existed. So yes, more still gives you a little bit of a boost. So going from one to three layers still helps a little bit. But this was very interesting to us that if we just use one of these tensor product layers, and, and obviously this is going to be quite fast, um, you can still do better than you know, all of these message passing approaches. And, and some of these, you know, tried, I think Noisy Knows, for example, this is recent DeepMind paper where they say, you know, can we build these really, really uh, 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 deep message passing networks? Um, and the other ones sort of have the typical, you know, five or six uh, message passing layers. And we see, you know, you, you can actually just do one of these Allegro layers um, and you do uh, quite well. And then one thing that's, that's uh, actually much more interesting to us, uh, you know, except for these, um, these sort of very raw benchmarks, is to say how transferable are these models? And there's a very nice, nice uh, uh, test that was recently proposed um, by David Kovac in the group of Gabo Chani, where they take a small flexible molecule and then they measure the transferability. So they me measure the out of distribution generalization through a test where they have uh, data sampled at three different temperatures. So this is uh, molecular dynamics run at 300, 600, and 1200 Kelvin. And so what's gonna happen here is at 300 atoms will sort of move a little bit. At 600, they will move quite a lot. And then at 1200, there will be a lot of movement. And this is a flexible molecule. So these, these will really wiggle around a lot. And then what they do is they train only on the 300 Kelvin data. And then they test on 600 and 1200. And this is sort of a very, very principled way of testing how you know, generalizable is your, is your potential. Um, and, and what you're seeing here again in the different, different you know, color, I guess, shadings, is again a set of a set of methods. Um, in red, you're again seeing the quip, which does much much better than all these other ones. And then in in green, you're seeing Allegro, which is again sort of on par with the quip, maybe a tiny bit worth. Um, but but it's sort of very very remarkable to us that you know this massively overparameterized network and and these have you know again millions of weights. They they don't only do well in domain, but they also show very strong out of domain generalization. Um, and then in particular, one thing I want to point out here is that these two bars here, they're from the ANI model. So ANI is a widely used method in, um, in drug discovery. It's a, it's, a, it's a neural network that was pre-trained here on 8.9 million structures, um, whereas our methods are simply trained, and, and the other ones uh, as well for that matter, are only trained on 500 structures. Um, and, and even despite that difference, you know, they, they do much, much better. And you see you sort of 300, you know, it's in domain, it's very well. But then 600, 1200, you're, you're going out of domains, so your errors increase, but they're still much, much um, smaller than, than other models. I want to very briefly show, you know, this works also in practice beyond just, you know, bold faced numbers. Um, so we do use this every day to run molecular dynamic systems in our group. Here, uh, we're modeling, um, again, a very complex battery material. It predicts the structure and the kinetics um, uh, very, very uh, uh, nicely, and with that, I'll, I'll pass over to Albi again. Oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> that was a little bit too quick for me. Sorry. Uh, can you go oh. back to that slide? Of course, of course. Uh, this like guy? Here, yeah, what, what are we even showing here? Oh, oh, okay. I didn't know this was uh, would be interesting to this group. Okay, perfect. All right, so what we're looking at here is Li3PO4. So this is a uh, potential electrolyte material. And what we're doing here is we collected training data at a very high temperature. So yeah. at 3000 Kelvin and the melts. 
and then also in a quenched state. So what you do there is you very rapidly cool it down to 600 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. And then you, you get some amorphous structure. And then what we're doing is we're running a simulation at 600 Kelvin. So in this quenched state. And then we're saying what we're measuring on the top here, this is a, a structural distribution function. So this is the probability of an angle. And the angle here is um, the, what's called the tetrahedral angle. So what we're measuring here is what angle does A and D, that's the, that's the quantum method, what angle does that predict? And what angle does Allegro predict? And you but, see that, yeah, go ahead. Well, what do you mean with tetrahedral angle? Like how can this ever change or like if ah, I- so you have a finite temperature and atoms move around, right? Yeah. And so ah, you will have okay. a central atom. I get it now. Yeah, in this case, you have a phosphorus atom and two oxygen atoms. And there will be an angle oh. between them, but as they move, that angle the, will change. The mode will always be the same, but the the distribution could change a little bit. Well, no, the mode can also change if, if you if you increase or decrease the temperature beyond a certain point, right? But the, the thing is, can you act um can you uh, accurately uh, uh, capture this? Because atoms move, right? So it, I could I could have a movement like this, right? Yeah, yeah, but I would have guessed that in a tet tetrahedron. It is, the... you know, you, I'm saying if you go to very extreme temperatures, you're completely oh, okay. right. On average, this mode will, will be very, very close around these 109.5. Oh, okay. So the simple geometry yeah. argument. Um, and then in the bottom right, you're seeing the lithium MSD. Uh, so this measures how the lithiums move through the material and you're measuring the mean squared displacement. And this is sort of something that's typically very difficult to capture because it's a kinetic property and things move over time and, and atoms migrate, et cetera, et cetera. And um, what is and Delta T? Uh, delta T what is, uh, Delta Tau is the time that has passed. So here you're measuring, if I have some reference position at, a, at time t equals zero, and then I've moved for 10 picoseconds, how fast, how far has the lithium atom moved? Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Just wanted to very quickly show this also works in practice. And I think Albie will finish up with some scalability. We're, we're not in a hurry. Like, at, at least I'm not. And that's all I care about. <laughs> ah, okay, perfect. perfect. Yeah, uh, uh, I also care about whether you two are in a hurry, but if that's not the case, then... No, no, no. Know. I just figured uh, at, at half, but okay, then we're good. Yeah. Right. If we're not in a hurry, I can talk about speed very slowly. <laughs> um, no. Uh, so, yeah, I just want to close out with a bit of a, you know, we time and justified a lot of this work and motivated it at the beginning uh, with discussion of scaling, right? We were discussing locality, parallelization. And so I want to just give some information on what we've actually empirically been able to do with this. One thing I'll just, there was a question in the chat that I just want to address quickly because it's relevant to this. Somebody asked, you know, have you tried optimizing these tensor product operations? I think we mentioned Triton. Uh, in general, yes, not Triton in particular. We've, I've spent a lot of time trying to optimize this operation. We've had some great success. We have further efforts on that, but a lot of it is fundamental, right? Because this, the size of these tensors increases as you increase the rotation order, the number of possible tensor product configurations, or, uh, combinations, I should say, also blows up uh, as you sort of increase the set of representations you're using in your network. So while there's a lot you can do to optimize this and make it as close to optimal on the hardware as possible to kind of try to match the uh, code level overhead optimization that has been done for you know, simple MLPs, you're never going to get around the kind of fundamental mathematical scaling problems that the equivariant tensor space has compared to the scalar features. With that said, we've achieved um, some pretty excellent speeds with these models and some of the careful optimization we've done on it. Uh, first, I'm just showing, this is exactly the same model Simon was just talking about that reproduced these uh, you know, structural and kinetic properties. On a small, uh, I should say with DFT, is DFT is one of these quantum, uh, very expensive quantum calculation methods that we can use to sort of get ground truth data. And on a similar size system to DFT, we're able to achieve a quite high 32 nanometer 
per day of simulation with our Allegro model. But then the key thing is that a lot of these machine learning methods can get you high speed or higher speed than quantum methods at these small systems. The question is, how do they scale? Um, what? And so, why? like, I don't understand why this takes so long. A hundred. So, how many steps do you actually do in the one hundred and ninety uh, in the thirty-two point four nanoseconds? Ah, well, you know, typical time steps are about two femtoseconds. So that's okay. Uh, how many orders of magnitude? It's quite a few. Uh, nano pico. Uh, femto is ten to the minus fifteen. So it's six. It's six orders of magnitude. Yeah, like yeah. you go femto, pico, nano. Yeah. Okay. So you have, uh, you have like three, thirty-two million, thirty-two yeah. million steps that you're exactly. So here it's a two femtosecond time step. So here it would be more like sixteen million steps. But yeah, you have to do sixteen millions of these um, yeah. per day. Yeah. Okay. So we then, have again. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Your model can like we do sixty million forward passes in twenty four hours. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And remember, because it's a time evolution, you cannot batch, right? Yeah. You were to do drug discovery, and you were to screen, you can batch. <laughs> we can't batch. We need the. Yeah. We need the input from the previous step. All right. Right. So, and as happy as we are with this. Uh, what's important and what was motivating for us is how does it actually scale? Uh, so first, just theoretically, how does, how does this approach scale? Uh, it scales linearly in the number of atoms. This is fairly typical for machine learning approaches here, but still in contrast to some that, that take a global approach. We scale linearly also in the number of neighbors per atom, the number of edges. And the, here it's sort of in contrast to, I think, a sort of much broader variety of approaches that have quadratic scaling, uh, for example, such as such as DimeNet, such as the equivariant transformers with their attention mechanisms. And this can be quite a big saving. I mean, if you remember that water example Simon showed, you know, even within the strict local cutoff, you have 96 neighbors, for example, in this water at standard temperature and pressure. Some systems are much more dense, or you do need somewhat larger cutoffs. So this M is not necessarily that small. So making so, that linear scaling is also quite helpful. This is because um, with the with your method, for example, we're just looking at each neighbor once, so to say. And if we're doing something like DimeNet, then for every neighbor, we need to calculate multiple angles and then um, aggregate all of these angles. And these, yeah, then the the net or the, the number of angles that we need to calculate depends on the number number of neighbors so it's precisely um, because in diamond you're explicitly yeah. enumerating all triplets yeah okay and then and then finally the last sort of scaling i want to point out this is maybe not as obvious uh if one hasn't played with these descriptor methods uh before but Allegro, like the other deep learning approaches, scales, most of them at least, scales constantly. It basically doesn't scale with the number of atom types, the number of node types. This may seem very obvious uh, to people who are used to doing only deep learning approaches, but the previous strictly local descriptor-based approaches uh, that had this ability to parallelize, those are not uh, favorably scaling in the number of atom types, they scale quite poorly, uh, quadratically or worse, as you increase their fidelity. Um, so being able to combine the locality with this fixed favorable scaling as you add more types of atoms is actually quite advantageous when comparing to those class of methods. And then finally, just to close us out, I'd like to demonstrate these scalings are not theoretical. These scalings are things we have achieved and actually run and benchmark. Uh, first, I'd like to show that we can scale practically for a fixed system size. So we can take advantage of this ability to parallelize. Uh, here I'm running on a system of 400,000 atoms that we took. And, and I should mention that all of this scaling work um, we owe to the excellent work of our colleague, Andrew Johansson, also in Boris Kaczynski's group. And what I'm showing here is 
Sorry, uh, Alvi. Okay. Um, yes. You were cut off there a little bit. Uh, what ah, you're showing here is the. Ah, what I'm showing here is speed on the y-axis, uh, the nanoseconds per day measurement on this 400,000 atom system. But then on the x-axis, I'm showing the number of GPUs. So any of these, you know, as far as I know, pretty much any of these message passing networks previously certainly equipped, there would be one data point on this plot because you could only run it on one GPU. Now with the strict locality, we're very easily able to parallelize and we get uh, pretty much ideal scaling for intranode uh, scaling where we are just using more GPUs sharing a single compute node. And we still get excellent improvement in the speed as we add more and more compute nodes, each of which has eight GPUs. And we didn't push the plot further, but you can see, you know, at 64 GPUs, we're able to achieve on this very large, you know, 400,000 atom system, a quite respectable 16 nanoseconds per day. Uh, and this is really important to us just at a conceptual level that it gives us the ability to increase our speed by throwing resources at the problem, which was not something we could do before for our machine learning MD with the deep networks. Then the other sort of kind of scaling, uh, the other way we can use this parallelization is to move to very large systems. And this uh, is a picture of a system we actually ran. We like it very much because you can't even see the individual atoms anymore. And this is 100 million atoms. Uh, this happens to be like a silver, a silver crystalline system with, with a vacancy near the melting point. Uh, we are able to simulate 1.5 nanoseconds per day on this, which I know that's a bit of a sort of context-free number, but that's sort of getting to the point of science with this. So you could like compute a lot of things you might be interested in computing. And this we were able to run on 16 GPU compute nodes, each with eight A100, which you know it's a lot of compute, but for a system of this scale is actually quite reasonable. Uh, and finally, this is you know, all achieved through integration with the very popular LAMPS molecular dynamics code, which is sort of the forefront of doing like exascale MD. Mm -hmm. And then the last uh, thing I just want to mention is that this is all public and available. Uh, these are open source codes that we have developed and uh, put out there for people to use. Uh, we have both a quick model and also a framework uh, for designing, training, testing, and deploying these equivariant machine learning potentials. Allegro is implemented as an extension package to this. This is all pretty heavily optimized. We have full compiled model support for Python 3 deployment, which is what we're using to run these giant systems. You know, if you're interested in any of the details of this, you know, please feel free to check it out on our GitHub. And then just to close it out, just to return to Simon's sort of pentagon of, of desires, the things we want out of these machine learning potentials more broadly in our uh, machine learning potentials and atomistic learning community overall. Accuracy, we think we're really getting there. Uh, with these equivariant models, as you can see, you know, with the Quip or Allegra, we're getting really excellent accuracy. Computational efficiency, scale, we believe that this, you know, we're, we're pretty much there. We can run things almost embarrassingly, embarrassingly parallelly scaling um, now with high accuracy deep learning methods. Speed in general across the community, I would say not quite. Uh, with Allegro, we're pretty happy we're getting closer, but always, you know, as we discussed at the very beginning, always we want more speed. Um, sample efficiency, as Simon showed, you know, these learning curves, equivariant seems to be a really fundamental solution to this problem, changing this slopes of the learning curves. And, and this, you know, we hope to maintain with Allegro. Theory, sort of yes and no. We have a good understanding in general, I think, of the kinds of functions we're trying to learn, which of, which of the models do well. There's nice work to characterize the failure modes of different models. But where I think we're really lacking is you know, all this formalism I described to you, pile of geometric tensors, tensor products. We have very little understanding of the learning dynamics, you know, of how do these models learn? What kinds of representations do they learn? in these equivariant objects. That I think is really uh, still very much an open question. 
And then finally at the top here, you know, as Simon was mentioning, something we care about very, very much in machine learning in general, but also in this area of simulations is transferability. And on the one end, we have some promising results here, as Simon showed, you know, temperature transferability, some generalization to, to larger systems, for example, and other things we've seen go pretty well. But there are still very fundamental questions here. I think we discussed this briefly before uh, most people had joined the call. You know, uncertainty quantification remains an enormous unsolved challenge in this field to sort of understand when our models are transferring confidently, when we're running simulations as they explore new states, when we can actually hope that we're transferring well in a robust way. So this is, I think, a big open challenge, but we're making nice progress. Um, and just you know, here we're marking with these little spherical harmonics, places where in particular we think that equivariance is playing a key, a key role. I guess there should really also be one next to theory in the sense that we want more theory of equivariance and of this equivariant formalism. With that, uh, I think that concludes what Simon and I have prepared. We'd just like to thank uh, all of our most wonderful co-authors on this work uh, all across the top, uh, people from the Mir Group and, and our collaborators, some of our sources of compute and funding for this and our other projects. And of course, we'd like to thank you for all, all the great questions so far and for your you know, patience in, in joining us on a, on a pretty deep dive into what we've been doing. And thank you for the depth of that dive. I, I really appreciate you taking the extra time. An awesome discussion with Simon and Alan. So if you want to join discussions like that yourself in the future with the authors of great papers, then make sure to find all the information in the description where we also have a Slack channel or you, we have a mailing list where you get weekly updates on the following papers.